Um, Mr Milgram, just a handful of further questions on the issue of hepatitis C financial support. Sure. Um, if we go to DHSC 0006217 underscore 027. Starting at page 18, there's a chronology, um, I, and I think my current understanding is that this part of it at least is, was compiled by Mr Lister. Um, if we go to the bottom of the next page, we've got the entry for the 4th of November and the discussion you had with Mr Chisholm, which I'm, I'm not going to go back to, over the page... various other dates are picked up. I just wanted to ask you about one further matter on the next page, please, Lawrence. So the entry for the 20th of November 2002 is Secretary of State meets Helen Liddell to discuss hepatitis C payments. First of all, what was Helen Liddell's role? So she would have been Secretary of State for Scotland at that time. Um, and as I understand it from your statement, You've no recollection of any particular meeting, and unfortunately, we've not found any documents that, that refer to No, it. the only thing that, subsequent to writing my statement, that I came across in the pack of papers was a, um, was a submission, not to me, but to Andrew Smith, who was then the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, suggesting that he had a conversation with Helen Little and, I think, with me, in the margins of cabinet. So in other words, there was a weekly cabinet meeting on a Thursday morning, and the suggestion seemed to be from that that Andrew raised his concerns with Helen about, or maybe it was the other way around, about this whole devolution or reserved is issue. So, um, but I, you know, I've got no recollection of that conversation happening. And it might have been that the conversation that happened was a Helen Liddell, um, Andrew Smith conversation rather than one involving me. So, um, and, and sorry not to be more. Right, you know, there's, a, the, there's a letter from Andrew Smith to Helen Liddell, 10th of December. Um, I, I, we don't need to put it up on screen, but the reference DHSC 00422751111. Um, we, we can take that down, thank you. Um, so, the letter to the law officers or request for advice from the law officers having gone off on the 30th of January 2003, the final Ross Committee report was published in March 2003. I'm not going to go to it. Reference to the transcript again, HSOC 0020367. Um, as I understand it, you don't think you read that either, for, presumably for the reasons you've already given? I mean, I would see no particular reason why I should have been sent it, never mind read it. Um, so as at the point at which... Imagine, it, yeah. it, would, it, it would be the equivalent, I think, of Scottish ministers being sent English papers. We were now in a completely... We were in the devolved paradigm, so to speak. So, you know, Scotland was looking after Scotland, by and large, on health issues not exclusively so, and England was looking after England. But, but just, just picking up on that, and bearing in mind that, <clears throat> that you and your colleagues were obviously aware that the Ross Committee had reported, and, what, and in broad terms, what its recommendations were. Sure. Do, do you think that um, you or one of your ministerial colleagues should at least have either read it or asked for a briefing about its reasoning so that you could understand why it was in Scotland it was now being recommended that there should be hepatitis C payments and to consider whether that reasoning would also be applicable in England. Well, I think that was happening. I mean, certainly not from, from me, but from the ministers con concerned because the Ross Committee and indeed the whole question of what Scotland was going to do in the light of the ongoing campaign, which had been very effective, by the way, in England as well as in, in Scotland, um, the views of the Health Select Committee in the Scottish Parliament, if you look at the papers, these are pretty well, you know, these are, there are, there are, there are quite a lot of references to, to, to these things. And I can't recall from, from the papers now, because I obviously haven't got all of them in front of me, but 
I would be surprised if the second report, which, as I recall from the papers, was really about the financial package, that must have been the subject of interrogation by officials in the Department of Health in England, at least I would have thought, and may well have formed the basis of subsequent interactions with ministers. But in, in terms of the, the, the issue of principle that there should be financial support, um, can I put it this way? Would, would you expect that the department, someone within the department, leave aside whether it's a civil servant or a minister, um, that someone would be looking at the, the, the reasons why this was being recommended to see whether they were applicable to England, whether they should feed into a change in, in, in the English policy approach? Well, I think the reasons were, I think they were understood. I mean, I think the reasons were understood in England and in Scotland. We came to different conclusions about what the best response was to that, to those reasons and to, to what had happened in the past. So I don't think that in any way, shape or form, either officials or ministers were you know, closing their mind. And I think one of the very striking things for me, actually, as I went through you know, the pretty extensive papers, was that you know, I think ministers were <clears throat> in a continual process of looking at what the right course of action was to, to, to take. I think, I think the conclusion that was reached in England was that if there was going to be a priority in terms of how resources were going to be allocated, it was more that those resources should go to the improvement of services and treatment for people suffering from hepatitis C than necessarily into compensation for all those awful things that had happened in the past. And, you know, sometimes I think the, there's a risk in this debate that, you know, people in England were looking as if they were mealy-mouthed and mean-spirited. And I actually think that that would be not reasonable and doesn't really concord with the facts. So, you know, f for example, decisions that were taken in England around, for example, combination therapy that I know wasn't the holy grail and wasn't the answer, but was an improvement on what had gone before, those were quite deliberately referred to the National Institute of Clinical, Clinical Excellence as it was then. They were fast-tracked. That decision was made by NICE. It wasn't a straightforward decision in the sense that the costs per treatment were about £10,000 per year per patient, which is a relatively high number, but that was the right thing to do. And what is more, directions were issued to local NHS bodies in England to say, if NICE has made a decision which is recommending that these treatment should be available, you have to make them available. The cost of that was around £80 million. Pounds. And similarly, you know, we came to decisions later around recompetence, which again was actually quite a fine issue that, that, that was raised, I think, um, to, to, to me by, by Hazel and I think Phil Hunt, but certainly by, by Hazel. In fact, it was raised by both of them, I can, I can now recall. and. Um, the situation was put to me in the light of the Committee on Safety and Medicine's concern that it was possible that the previous generation of recompetence contained some elements that potentially were human-based and therefore there was a risk of transmission of CJD as a, as a consequence of, of their usage. And we took the decision, I think rightly, <clears throat> and again I think the costs were around £80 million over a three-year period, that this should be made available, not least, and I think this is a, a significant point, not least in the light of what had happened in previous times, that it was very sensible to try to err on the side of caution, if you like, wherever possible, to adopt the precautionary principle, rather than just to assume that there is a risk and it will be okay. And so, so these were decisions that were positive decisions, and obviously the hepatitis C strategy that you were referring to earlier was part of that. And all of these things, you know, all of these decisions, they brought 
resources, investment with, with them. And that was a good thing because that was about providing more treatment and care for people who really needed it, recognizing absolutely what people had, had, had gone through. And that, I think, was as a conscious sort of mindset that, that I and my ministers had. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, the question of, of compensation is one thing, but that wasn't in any way the decision that we took. It wasn't in any way to suggest that we didn't recognize, understand, have huge empathy for people who were, who were suffering. And what we wanted to try to do was to alleviate that in the best way that, that we could. Would you accept, however, in principle, that the options you've described, that they're not binary options, it's not, it's not mutually exclusive, that you, financial support, ex gratia payments, on the one hand, funding treatment for combination therapy, other strategies for hepatitis C on the other? It's a very, very good and a very fair point. They're not binary, and neither are decisions being taken about patients suffering from hepatitis C or patients suffering from cancer or coronary heart disease or with mental health problems. And the point about decision making is that you have to balance the needs of a number of patient groups and a number of patients across the piece and try to get that balance right and try to find the right means of recognizing those needs against the resources that were available. Now, fortunately, there were resources available, but it wasn't a, in any way, as everybody knows, it's never in healthcare a bottomless pit. There isn't a healthcare system in the world that doesn't struggle with, if you like, the gulf between supply and demand. Um, and so these were the macro decisions that principally as Secretary of State, you have to grapple with. You mentioned the hepatitis C strategy. I'm reminded, and I'm grateful to Ms. Gray for reminding me of this, when I asked you earlier about um, that reference in one of the submissions to people who may be infected but not knowing that they were infected, and I asked you about whether in principle the, 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 you would expect something to be done in relation to that, um, I'm reminded the hepatitis C strategy does indeed does address that to some extent. Um, um, I, I, there's no need for me to go back to it, but I... I wanted to just I mean, put I think that on the a, record. It was a sort of, it was a useful, I think, and I think the first time that it had been done, looking at, you know, questions in the round about prevention, surveillance, treatment, support, and, of course, the important questions about removement, uh, removal of stigma and so on and so forth. Thank you for that reminder. Um, you, you've set out in your statement at paragraph 20 um, your... Um, the, the reasons for opposing a scheme of financial um, uh, assistance support, ex gratia payments to those infected with hepatitis C. I, I think we have in, in your answers to my questions largely covered the, the majority of the points that you make there. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were just a, two, two or three points I wanted to pick up. Um, the first is, um, you, you've told us why you regarded VCJD as exceptional in, in terms of decisions about compensation. Mm. Um, what was it, if anything, that distinguished the position of those suffering from hepatitis C from those suffering from HIV, whom the government had already agreed to make some payments to? Um, well, at the time that the then government, not my government, not my time. I mean, I think the reasons were pretty clear in that HIV at that time was, I mean, in some senses, the equivalent of variant CJD in my time, that if you got it, it there was a very high likelihood that you were going to, to die from it. And so it was a, it was a sort of known um, killer in that regard, but there was also I think in those days, and of course it changed, thankfully, thank heavens, it changed over time. Um, there was all the stigma associated with that, um, not least because um, it was sexually transmitted and so on, so on and so forth, and you'll have heard evidence from previous secretaries of state around grappling around those <coughs> issues. So I think there was, a, there was quite a sharp point of differentiation um, that, that resulted in the McFarlane Trust and, um, and the Eileen Trust. Um, 
just in terms of stigma, um, I think we, we saw from the brief look we had at the hepatitis C strategy that a, the majority of hepatitis C cases described there were the result of um, uh, intravenous drug use. And the inquiry has certainly held evidence about the stigma associated with hepatitis C, yes. assumptions being made that people are drug users or alcohol abusers and, 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 and the like. Um, is, is that something which was ever consciously thought about in, in terms of whether there really was such a gap between HIV and HCV? Well, I think it was thought about. You know, it's reflected very much in the hepatitis C strategy, as you know, because there's a... There's a section in, in, in the strategy, which you know, of course I didn't write, the CMO was primarily responsible for, and I think Hazel was the lead, lead minister on it, which is precisely about launching publicity campaigns and so on and so forth, designed to precisely tackle that stigma. And I might say, just at a, at a personal level, this is not you know, something that I was, um, that was about when I was Secretary of State, but you know, I. I spent some time listening to some of the evidence um, from people who um, have been infected with hepatitis C, and it is very striking and very moving when you hear not just about the physical impact, but also the stigma associated. Um, so, so, of course. Um, and, and then in your statement, if we just have up on screen WITN 6942001, it's page 41. Is this my statement? Yes. Yeah. I've got it here. Um, and it's the last sentence of paragraph 20.7, which is the first paragraph on the screen, <clears throat> first paragraph on page 41. Um, you say, actually, I'll just read the last two sentences. You say, I am, of course, aware that the distinctions were fine ones, and these lines were difficult to draw. And then you say this, it's also true that with each new exemption, the general rule against paying compensation was somewhat weakened. Now, the payments that were in contemplation at this stage were never truly compensation. They were, and indeed six previous governments have gone to pains to emphasise that they were ex gratia payments. What, to what extent was the making of ex gratia payments truly something that would weaken the rule against paying compensation? Well, I think back to the point I was making earlier. Every time that there was an ex gratia payment made, so you could argue that the variant CJD scheme was an ex gratia payment. Obviously, there's a package of care, and then there was an addition to that. There was money made available in recognition of the suffering and et cetera that people their families had, had, had gone through, every time one did that, it sort of begged a further question. And, and I think you can see that today. You know, John Reed made a, a decision that was different from the decision that I might have taken. I understand why he took it for very, very good um, reasons, as he put it, of compassion, which I absolutely understand. But the truth is, it hasn't really settled the argument it's still ongoing, which is why I guess we're here today. So, so I think one has to accept that, you know, every time there was an exemption, because that's how the department thought of it, let's, you know, an exemption here, an exemption there, it did erode a bit the sort of notion that the basis on which these things were done in general was somehow sustainable and that's the reason one of the reasons why you know people were sometimes resistant to making those ex gratia payments for precisely that reasons short of having an alternative system which is back to this question of no fault compensation and um, now as you've referred to not long after taking up his role your successor took a different course and we'll ask him about that next week when he gives evidence very good but having regard to that, and looking back now in, with the benefits of hindsight, um, was yours the wrong decision? Uh, no, I don't think it was the wrong decision in terms of the context that I faced. And that's, I mean, look, these are always very, very difficult questions, aren't they? Because, you know, there are always three layers of questions in these type of situations. One is, 
what happened then, what can you remember too, is you know, what might you have been thinking, and three, what is that, that you're thinking now. And so I think context is very important, and I'm sure that's something that the inquiry will be bearing in mind as we go along. So I think in the context that these decisions were being made then, with all of the sort of pressures, the need to, as I say, address these rather fundamental questions that were bedeviling the National Health Service back then. They've come back again, sadly, now. Was it going to be sustainable? Was public confidence capable of being restored? Was the services that were available for people timely and of sufficient quality to ensure that the best patient outcomes were achieved? These were quite existential questions. And most of the focus, inevitably my focus, was on trying to answer those. Um, so the focus was on the now and the future, and less, as we've been discussing, about some of the issues that happened you know, many, many years ago with all of the consequences that they had had for people. Looking back with the benefit of hindsight, did the decisions that I took settle the question? Well, they clearly didn't. And here we are today, you know, 30, 40 years later, never mind from my time, and we're still debating them. So, um, so that's a that's a with hindsight point, of course. Other ministers, civil servants, and indeed documents have, have from time to time used the phrase moral responsibility. I think we saw the reference to a moral case in that meeting discussing the, 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 the BSE inquiry report. Um, doing the best you can, um, what would make a what would give rise to a moral responsibility to, to do something by way of providing financial support? That's an incredibly difficult question to answer. Um, because there are no benchmarks or criteria or standards around what is a moral judgment. Is it a question of the scale of suffering? Is it a question of the likelihood of death arising from a particular issue. So the suffering would be one criteria, of course, the, the, the scale of suffering. But as I was trying to say to you, to you earlier, I think the moral or the, as I put it, the empathetic question was one question and a very, very important one, given everything that had happened to people. But that could only be, in terms of making decisions, it couldn't be the only benchmark for making a decision. Because you had to be able to make decisions against two further questions, which is a question of, as I say, legality. What was it possible within the constraints of how the system worked in terms of fault and compensation? and these wider questions, which we've just been debating in these last few moments about, and therefore, what would the wider consequences be for policy? And maybe this is just a, my own crude way of thinking about it now, at least, with the benefit of hindsight. And I can see what, the, what John did was, you know, if you were thinking about it through that lens of empathy and legality and, and policy, John obviously... I mean, he'll speak for himself, but I mean, his press statement, which I read, was very clear. He'd made a decision to up, if you like, the, 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 the decisions on compassionate grounds. But of course, he still had to deal with the consequences. So what that tells you, I think, is that you know, even people who are good friends like we are, I have a huge regard, regard for, for him, you know, you can come to very different judgments because they're very fine. They're almost gossamer-like in terms of the judgments that you've got to, got to make here. It's not, it's not really science. There's quite a lot of art in it. Can, can I turn to the question of public inquiry or, or lack of public inquiry? Of course. Um, and, and just look, look at two or three documents with you and then ask you some questions about the issue. 
The first document is at DHSC 0038521 underscore 083. This is the 8th of October 2001. It's a letter from you to Stephen O'Brien MP um, uh, on behalf of a constituent. Um, uh, and uh, um, if we go to the third paragraph, you say, I know the Manor House group, it's a particular campaign group, has raised many issues for discussion, including the provision of recombinant clotting factors <coughs> for all haemophiliacs, mm. a call for a public inquiry, and compensation for people with haemophilia. Um, and then you, the last paragraph, I'm aware that a meeting with representatives of the Manor House group was to be considered once ministers had had the opportunity to consider all the points that the group has raised. However, these matters are still under discussion, but ministers will be happy to consider a meeting as soon as this is completed. Now, I, 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 as we've looked through other documents, I pointed out from time to time where there's reference to, to an issue about a call for a public inquiry. And we can see it set out here. Campaigners are clearly calling for a public inquiry. Um, if we then just look at a couple of letters that were addressed to you. Um, first of all, WITN 1055046, please. Um, this is a letter addressed to you, 9th of April 2000. Um, it's from a, a long-standing campaigner um, and a partner of a uh, co-infected with HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, haemophiliac. I'm, uh, I'm not going to read it aloud, not least because it's a document that we looked at in the inquiry last week when we yes, heard I'm from sure, Ms. I'm, Ms. I'm Grace. I'm familiar with it. With it. Um, I saw it in the so back. we can see this letter is a call for public inquiry. Um, indeed, Ms. Grayson sends a copy of the letter to, to the Prime Minister. Um, and then there's a response um, to her MP, Jim Cousins, um, from Philip Hunt at WITN 1055057. Again, I'm not going to read through it. We've looked at it at it before and, and, and you've had the opportunity to see it but mm -hmm. um, a, 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 essentially it, um, uh, um, it, 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 it does not indicate that there's going to be a public inquiry and then one final letter for these purposes WITN 1055075 a, a letter from the same um, source Ms Grayson 10th of March 2001 addressed to you um, I won't read any of it aloud. If we just go to the third page, final sentence. Will the government now hold a public inquiry? I look forward to your reply. Um, now, first of all, w w would these letters, do you think, if we leave aside, obviously, the letter from Stephen O'Brien, which you, you I think, would have seen, but yeah. would the other letters ha have... Um, probably come across your desk? No, I mean in exactly the same way as we were discussing earlier and the very fact that um, Carol Grayson received a reply from Phil Hunt tells you that the letter went through the system that I was describing earlier so I know it looks and sounds odd but that's how the system works so I would never have seen this letter. I've seen it now obviously because it's part of the very useful documentation that I've been able to read. But you would have certainly have known, is this right, from the other documents, including but not limited to the letter that you wrote to Stephen O'Brien, um, um, that there was, um, uh, um, in the background, a call from campaigners for a public inquiry. I think I would have been aware that that was around as an issue. I think, um, and indeed the, the letter to Stephen O'Brien makes that clear, maybe a, a couple of comments on that, the, the first is, I think that my impression, certainly now, I, I'm not sure what my impression was then, but my impression was that the predominant issue was the question of should there be financial compensation. And an important but secondary issue was the question of a public inquiry. I think secondly, um, I can't recall, in fact, I'm pretty sure that this didn't happen, 
that on no occasion was a request made to me either by officials or ministers that the department should consider a public inquiry. So in that sense, in terms of the processes that we were discussing earlier, there were other issues that arose through that process, the combatant, the issues around the, um, 90, uh, the, um, the judgment, uh, et cetera. They, they naturally arose, and that didn't so around the question of a, of a public inquiry. And I think, and probably this is, if it's all right to answer this with the benefit of, hi again, of hindsight, because it's just so difficult to recollect what one was thinking all those years ago. But I think if I'd felt that there was a situation where there was substantial doubt that issues hadn't been aired in the public domain, that there was evidence of systemic negligence and critically, because public inquiries have a very important role to play in this regard, there hadn't been some evidence of lessons being learned, then I might have concluded that a public inquiry would be necessary. But, I mean, the truth is that back to the lines to take question and the, and the group think that we were discussing earlier, there was a very well established view in the department that transcended successive governments, successive ministers and so on and so forth, that uh, quote, the facts were established. But more importantly than that, there was a very public campaign. And you see it in this letter from, from Stephen or from, uh, or from Carol. Um, and it was carried in a very public way, most notably into both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. I mean, particularly by Alf Morris, a former Labour colleague of mine who was absolutely indefatigable, you know, and continually was raising these questions in the House of Lords with, with Phil Hunt. So it wasn't that there weren't issues being aired, so there was not the fact there was something that hadn't somehow been already uncovered. These were out, and they were in the public domain, and usually the point about a public inquiry is that they're not. So, so I think I might have felt that a public inquiry therefore wasn't necessary. And I guess two further things that I think might have swayed that view had I been fully aware of them at the time. The first is that Yvette Cooper very wisely, in, in my view, and I wasn't, I think, aware of this at the time, she did instigate an internal investigation, as you know, into these questions which David Owen had originally raised about what happened to papers within the department around self-sufficiency, the policy that David had um, introduced in the mid to late 1970s. So there was an internal investigation underway. And I think if I had been considering the idea of a public inquiry, I would have certainly wanted to wait and see what that internal investigation had come up with. Now, as it happens, I wasn't aware of it. And the second thing that I wasn't aware of, and indeed, um, the chairman raised this, this earlier, was this, the fact that Scotland had had an, had an inquiry of its own. And I guess if I'd known that, and I'd known that it had reached the conclusions that it did, arguably in more difficult circumstances than England because of the delay in introducing um, heat treatment. You know, there's an 18-month difference uh, between 1985 and 1987. I think that would have been a factor again swaying me against a public inqu inquiry, I think. Um, so, so those, I think, would have been, or could have been rather, some of the things that might have been on my mind. Um, so is it right to understand um, that there is no explicit decision by you 
not to hold a public inquiry because the matter never comes before you by way of a submission asking you to, to make a decision? Certainly not that, I'm, well, not that I've seen, and I would have expected in the hundreds and I don't know how many pages of documentation that, that I've received, that would have been a pretty seminal issue, I would have thought. So I'm assuming that that documentation is accurate in, in, in answering that question in the negative. But you were aware, and your colleagues would have been aware, that there were calls for a public inquiry, um, um, and for the reasons you've explained and also set out in your statement, um, looking at it now, you think if it had come to you for a formal decision, for those reasons, you are likely to have said no? I think at the time, I think I would have said no. Uh, before I just ask you a handful of questions arising out of some, some of the, 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 the reasoning you set out in your statement, can I just deal with one further point of detail? Um, Carol Grayson, whose, whose letters to you we, we looked at a moment ago, uh, and who gave evidence to the inquiry um, uh, um, at the end of last week, uh, um, uh, gave evidence about um, uh, um, being due to go on to... Um, uh, a, a, a TV debate. Question um, time. Question time, news night. Yeah. I think she said question time. Sorry, yes. Um, and then someone saying, calling her and saying that you wouldn't go on it if she was on it. Um, uh, and then um, she describes essentially being rather infuriated by this and going to the where it was going to be held um, and shoving some papers at, at you um, um, so that at least you had you had those, if, if she wasn't to be allowed to participate in the debate. And I know you've seen the transcript of that this well, morning. Well, you very kindly yeah. brought that to my attention this morning, yes. Uh, um, do you have any, any recollection of those events? Do you, do you think that's correct? I have zero recollection of it. In fact, I've got zero recollection of ever appearing on Question Time in Newcastle. Um, I think I only did Question Time once. It was a programme that I detested. Uh, and still do to this day. I did it in Leeds. I didn't appear on it in Newcastle. And so after you very kindly alerted me to, to the fact that you might be raising that question, I did a bit of diligence of my own this morning, and uh, I consulted the modern-day oracle Wikipedia um, to see whether or not Wikipedia had a list of who appeared on question times at which point and there was no question time in Newcastle, according to the Wikipedia references that I appeared on. So I think, unfortunately, I don't think that is um, entirely accurate. I think Ms. Grissom also said, I think, in the transcript that you showed me that um, I don't know whether she quite used the, the phrase, I'm a pariah, but she used a phrase like, like that, that I wasn't being listened to or, or, or something of, of, of that, that sort. I think suggesting I'd, maybe you could... So people were avoiding me like the plague. People were avoiding me like the plague. That's exactly the, the phrase. And, and I sort of looked at that, and I'm pretty certain... Um, I don't think I met Carol Grayson, and, you know, nor necessarily would I, given that it, you know, responsibilities were being owned by, by, by my ministers, but I didn't want that to go unanswered because I'm pretty clear that she was part of delegations that certainly met Yvette Cooper, who was the minister responsible, and I think they well have met Phil Hunt as well, just to be clear. Um, can, can I then just ask you um, to, to look at the, the section of your statement that deals with um, inquiries? It's WITN 6942001, um, uh, and it starts on page 44. Um, uh, and the bottom of the page, you say, um, uh, um, just thank you, so paragraph 22.2, you can't recall being asked to consider establishing a public inquiry. I believe at the time I'd probably not have agreed to one if I had been. And then you set out a number of reasons. Now, I'm, again, I'm not going to go through um, all, all of them, and, and some of them you've already referred to. If we go to the top of the next page. Um, the, the first reason you give is there was no evidence that you were aware of suggesting there had been wrongful action or serious fault on the part of the NHS system. You refer to that being contested. Um, and you say, uh, five lines down, the background to this tragedy seemed to be reasonably well understood. Uh, and you refer to 
that was the basis of briefings at the time. Sure. Um, and one of the examples you give, relevant facts, largely established information in the public domain. And, and, and that is what in, indeed one of the papers, or, or I think quite possibly more than one of the papers, um, asserts. Um, to, to what extent should ministers take at face value those kind of assertions, potentially be, you know, being made by the very department that might be criticised in any inquiry? You know, it's all in the public domain. There's no real, you know, things that we did wrong. Sh surely that's something that ministers should potentially be seeking to interrogate. Yes, and I think we went through some of that this morning, and I think Sir Brian got involved in some of these questions as well. Um, and I think, of course, one should bring an inquiring mind, and as I was indicating to you earlier, I think certainly my reputation inside the Department of Health, I think, was that I brought a rather challenging mind on, on many of these issues. I can remember um, Michael Barber, Sir Michael Barber, who became head of the Prime Minister's delivery unit in number 10, uh, characterizing my time in the department as a coup d'etat against it, because I was pre precisely challenging. Um, but there's a limit, you, you know, because, and there's also a balance, because the truth is, as a minister, and you referred earlier to the endless chopping and changing of ministers and reshuffles and so on. I was very lucky, you know, in that I'd done one year and then got the opportunity of doing four years. That was five years in total. That's quite unusual. Um, but even with five years of continuity, you are very reliant and have to be on officials for briefing, background, understanding, the transmission of advice and assistance. So, and particularly when it comes to dealing with issues that hadn't happened on your watch you know, your sort of, your focus as a minister, invariably and for very, very good reasons, not even political reasons, but for good reasons about democratic legitimacy, you're focusing on the things that you need to do that you've promised that you will do, looking to the future. That's where your, your focus is. So there's a limit about how much, given the weight of what one has to do, how capable you really are about interrogating the past. And as I say, thinking about it today, I would say that that is a problem because there isn't a mechanism that exists to do so short of a public inquiry. Now, public inquiries come along very rarely. You know, um, they do, and it's obviously very welcome to very many people, including, I suspect, people here today, that there finally is a public inquiry. Um, and, and they come along in, 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 in sometimes slightly peculiar ways. You know, people campaign for them, that's great. An issue arises, something needs to be done, a public inquiry is set up. But I can think of so many issues where you know, if I think about what has what has arguably been the biggest, had the biggest impact on mortality and morbidity in this country when it comes to healthcare, health inequalities. We don't have a public inquiry on that. Maybe we should, because successive governments have tried and haven't really made progress. The public inquiries, my point is, are pretty rare events. Um, and so we don't have a systematic way currently of being able to interrogate the past to ensure that the story that is being told is a wholly accurate one. Now, the problem with the truth is that there are always different versions of it. That's what happens. You know? There's one truth and then there's another truth. And if you're in a decision-making position, you're having to arbitrate between them. That's where you sit. And I do think that these questions about how you do interrogate the past, they sort of need better mechanisms other than the blunt instrument and sometimes the happenstance of a public inquiry being established on the one side or reliance upon the system, 
to do its own interrogation. And that's why I've been thinking about this a lot. This is why I think we need something different as a vehicle that can enable us to do that. Not for everything, because you can't keep going over everything. Because if you keep doing that, you can never make pro progress clearly. But where there are issues like this, you know, which you know, are substantive issues because of the harm that was inflicted, and where there is a contest about what the truth is, it would be good to think that we can come up with something that could do that job of work. Just going back to, to, to the issues in, in, in relation to in, infected, blood, infected blood products, shouldn't the scale of what had happened, thousands of patients infected with viruses that could and did kill directly from their treatment by the state, shouldn't that have been enough for someone in government, whether it's the administration of which you were a part or an earlier or a later administration, to say, if you'll forgive the colloquialism, how the hell did that happen? Thousands of people infected. We have to understand why, whether or not there's fault on the part of the state, we have to understand why so we can ensure it never happens again. And that is what we do have to ensure. And I want to come back to that point, by the way, about whether lessons have been learned, because I think it's an absolutely critical, critical point. I think what was not in dispute at all is the scale of what happened. Everybody knew it, of course. Um, I described it earlier in the way that I did as a catastrophe, and that is, I think, right. And it's an understatement, probably. I don't know what the right word is, to, to be honest. Probably there isn't one that exists. Um, I also think that mainly, and this is obviously a contested position, how that had happened was reasonably well understood. How it had happened was reasonably well understood. Whether it should have been allowed to have happened is a quite different question. But the how question, I think people understand exactly what happened. That people were given blood products that were infected with hepatitis C. Um, uh, and all of the background that you know, you're much more familiar with than probably uh, most of us. Um, but whether or not that just, if, because public inquiries tend to be focused on things that there is uncertainty about how it happened. So Shipman would be a, a, a case in point. You know, I established the Shipman inquiry actually under some duress because initially it wasn't going to be a public inquiry then. There was a judicial review and it was a public inquiry and Dame Janet Smith did a, a very good job in sort of leading that. There were wholesale questions about how, how could it be that a GP in a practice could be killing all of these people and nobody seemed to realize. That was a big how question. And it led, as you know, to some quite, the inquiry led to some quite substantive changes, including changes to the Coroner's Act and, 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 and so on and so forth. So, so I, think, I think those were some of the reasons by way of explanation. The lessons learned point is a very, very, very important one in, in my view. And I think, I think this is where, actually, to be fair, there are many criticisms that can be leveled at the Department of Health and they are being aired in this inquiry, uh, rightly so. Um, I think where the Department of Health can take some credit is in terms of lessons being learned in this regard. <coughs> when I think about how I, we, approached variant CJD compared with how some of these issues had been approached in the past, I think there had been some lessons learned. And I think, for example, the primacy of the precautionary principle had risen way up the agenda. The precautionary principle, in the end, lay behind the decisions to, for example, source blood plasma from non-UK sources, an inversion of 
what people were concerned about with hepatitis C and HIV infections in blood. Why? Because there was a theoretical risk, at least, according to the self-same Committee on the Safety of Medicines, that blood products could be infected with variant CJD. So we took the decision to stop using uh, plasma from the UK and instead source them from the US. And in fact, we ended up an unusual thing to do. The Department of Health ended up buying, and paying I think $100 million or more to do so, a specialist plasma company to secure the supplies in such a way that we could be assured that variant CJD wasn't a problem. That was one of the things that we learnt, I hope. The precautionary principle, I think, also underpinned the decisions around recombinants. We were discussing this, this earlier. So I think, I think, it, I don't say all the lessons have been learned, by the way, but I think some of, certainly from my time, and that's 20 odd years ago now, and I hope, learnings have been further institutionalized since. And we were discussing, for example, questions of openness and so on. You see that. I saw it in my time, you know. You know, SEAC, which was the, the committee dealing with um, um, BSE-related uh, diseases, you know, regularly held press conferences, regularly, regularly published its minutes. The um, variant CJD incidence panel that was established as a sort of specialist panel to consider where and when incidents should be dealt with and how should it, we move to single-use instruments? Should patients be informed? Their minutes were published. Their um, press they held press conferences of their own. So you were in a climate by the early 2000s, let alone what we're in now, where the concept of openness was much more institutionalized. And I don't think that was purely because there were societal changes. I would like to think it's because lessons have been learned. At least I hope so. Um, so that's the last topic I was proposing to ask Mr Milgan about, but we will obviously need to take a further break now um, to give core participants an opportunity to suggest questions. Um, can I suggest 20 minutes? I yes. think that should suffice because I did ask during the earlier break for legal representatives to apply their mind to the issue. So. Well, we, we'll say not, not before quarter past five in that Thank case. You. Um, the, the purpose of this is because an inquiry is uh, a collaborative um, in, uh, inquiry as well as being interrogative, uh, and those who participate in it, core participants, have the right in statute to put questions through counsel uh, to the witness uh, obviously, they have to be given an opportunity to formulate those questions, having heard what else you might have to say and, and what council has already asked. Uh, and for that purpose, we take a, a break to allow them uh, to do so. There may be some, for instance, who are watching online who, who have yet to, to give her the questions they may want to ask. I can't tell you how many questions there will be. I just don't know. Um, council said 20 minutes. Uh, suggests she thinks there won't be that many, but there might be. Um, and it'll be as long as it takes when you come back. Surely good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, quarter past five.